All right, guys, I've got a big guy for you today. Former president of the Society for Consumer Psychology, Kravis Professor of Business, unbelievably highly cited. Go to his Google Scholar page, Michel Pham. How you doing, Michel? Hi, again. How are you? Great. It's so nice to, to finally sit down with you. Uh, as you know, I invited also Brian Wansink, so I'm trying to create a series within my YouTube channel of you know really interesting consumer researchers so that people can hopefully get excited about the things that we do and so thank you so much for accepting to be on well thank you for having me Gad. I'm very flattered that you would pick me with Brian <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to tell people how we originally first met do you do you remember where we I first remember met? everything Gad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do you want to tell this <laughs> do you want to tell the story or do you want me to tell the story? Uh, I don't know. It's up to you. I, I'm happy to fill in the blank. Okay, uh, so uh, let, me, let me start. So there's this uh, doctoral consortium that happens every year where uh, you, you know, business schools that have PhD programs in our field uh, will choose a doctoral fellow to represent them at this consortium. And uh, Michelle and I had been uh, fortunate enough to have been chosen as, our, as the representatives for our school. Uh, among some, I think there's maybe 100, 120 people. Is that, does that sound right? Is that... I think it was uh, smaller than that back smaller. then. I think probably maybe 70, 80, probably, okay. as far as I can recall. Now, I went back. I, I remember that there were a few real notables within our class. Uh, <laughs> and I went back, and I forgot that there were actually more notables than I had remembered. So let me... Now, for the general viewers, they may not remember this, but for people who are in our field, uh, th these names might sound familiar. So, of course, there's you. There's Nader Tavasoli who's now at London Business School, a big guy there. There's Jennifer Acker at Stanford. There's Kent Grayson from Northwestern. Uh, Angela Lee, also at Northwestern. So uh, there must have been something in the water in 1993 to produce. And I'm not speaking about myself. I'm speaking about you I guys. I thought that was a great crop. <laughs> I, um, there was also Peter Golder, who is right. at, uh, at Dartmouth. I, uh, Niraj Arora, who is at uh, Wisconsin. Uh, no, it was a, a very good year. I don't know what happened, but it was a... <laughs> It was a very good year as far as I can tell. Right, right. Uh, so I thought what we would maybe start by doing is talking about some of your research uh, with, while holding back on your seven sins of consumer psychology classic. That one I want to sort of address it separately. And so you were kind enough to send me some of uh, the papers that you thought would be particularly interesting to, to, to discuss. I picked four of them, and so maybe I will sort of just prime you about each one, and you could tell us, uh, you know, in layman's term, given our viewer audience, uh, about each of them, because they all sound fascinating. Uh, so let's start with the following. Uh, the Emotional Oracle Effect. I love that title. Tell us about that one. <laughs> I, 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 I was sure you would pick that one. As that's probably the one I would have picked as well. Right. It's, um, so the, the, you know, one of the things I've been trying to study over the last 20 years is, uh, is really... You know, you know, what difference does it make when people rely on their feelings and emotions when they make decisions? And um, um, for, for many, many years before my time in the field, a lot of people had a very, you know, what is known as cognitive view of how people make decisions. We were treating consumers as if they were computers and they were very rational beings and so on and so forth. And uh, if you know a little bit of, um, of human beings and in psychology, that, that is really not what is going on out there and, and, and the earlier part of my career was about to try to show that consumers actually use their feelings a lot when they make decisions. And uh, the latter part of the things I've done is that to try to understand now if they use their feelings to make decisions, what difference does it make? And, and the setting that we looked at in that research you're describing is, uh, is about, all right, if people rely on their feelings to try to predict something that's going to happen in the future, does that help them or does that hurt does that hurt them? Because rationally, you know, what you know, the common wisdom would say, feelings are not a good, uh, good type of information to be relying on if you try to make, you know, quote unquote, rational and, and meaningful judgments. And um, we had, um, uh, uh, I mean, the general gist, uh, big picture finding that we had in that paper is that when we have a method for getting people to trust more their feelings when they make a variety of decisions. And, and what we had them do in that paper is to try to say, okay, now there's an event going to happen in the future. We'd like you to predict which of two outcomes or which of multiple outcomes is going to take place. And, um, and what we found in general is that people were able to predict better. So we started um, noticing that in a study that was quite uh, 
uh, contemporary, if you will, it was in the 2008 presidential election, and there was a primary race between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. And, and we had this national sample of, uh, of, of voters that we reached out to, and we had these methods administered to them that made them, half of them, rely more on their feelings. And we asked them, who do you think is going to win that, that race? And it was in February 2008, if I recall correctly, and that was not resolved until much later. It was around June that that, that race, uh, that primary race was resolved. And, um, and it turns out that, uh, that uh, Barack Obama won, but the people who trusted their feelings predicted that with, uh, at a greater, greater rate than the people who didn't trust their feelings. And, and so we found that, that results and, and, and then that prompted us to, to sort of look in other settings where we might be able to see this as well. And so we had, a, you know, had a people predict whether a movie at the box office, which movie is going to do better this weekend uh, at the box office. And we found again that people who were encouraged to rely on their feelings were predicting better. Uh, which movie is going to do better at the, bo at the box office, which one's not going to do as well. So let me interject before you go on. So, that, so does, the, does the effect seem to uh, occur across domains and settings, or are you able to predict that for domains A, B, and C, this is where I think it'll happen, but uh, you know, EFG, it won't happen? Uh, it's a very good question. Um, one of the things that, that surprised us is how widespread mm -hmm. the phenomenon was. So. Initially, we had intuition that it would be in domains that where uh, the outcome is driven by people's you know, popularity uh, behavior. So people might say, you know what, I vote for Hillary Clinton, I vote for Herbert or Barack Obama, and maybe when people try to predict that, rely on their feelings is a good predictor. And that's what uh, would happen with the movies as well. Uh, and, but we were trying to find settings where we expected that not to be the case. And it still and happened. And, and, and it still happened. And it's really one of the, normally as a researcher, often you try to replicate your own effect and, and, and you're happy when it replicates. Uh, I, I must say in that paper, the challenge for us was to try to get the effect to go away. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and we actually went in different settings uh, where we expected the effect not to hold and we keep seeing it. And the one setting where we were the most surprised is when we had people try to predict the weather. Right. And, uh, and, and we found again the results uh, when uh, they were trying to predict <coughs> the weather. So to answer your question, where do we not find it? It turns out that there's two types of scenarios where you would not find it. One is when people just don't know enough about what they're supposed to predict. Uh, so we had uh, a, a, a study in which uh, we had people to try to predict the outcome of a football game. Uh, the college national college uh, football game that just played out uh, last week between Alabama and, and Clemson, and uh, and we found that the people who know not, uh, enough about football are able to predict greater if they run their feelings. People who just don't know anything about football, college football, are not able to. Um, and the other setting where uh, the uh, people will not do better is uh, settings in which it's completely random. Okay? Right. So. So we had them predict the weather like two weeks in advance. They can't predict it. So, which is not surprising. Okay? So what this finding is telling us is that when you rely on your feelings, you're able somehow to recruit some um, some some intuition of what is the most likely thing to to, to happen. And and the reason that is, and that's what we think is happening, is because uh, you know in the background of our minds, as we you know learn and go about our lives, we encode a lot of information not necessarily consciously. And when we have them, you know, sort of what do your feelings tell you, your feelings essentially act as a summary of everything you have learned. And that has a lot more information than when you try to act quote unquote rationally and try to isolate pieces of information that you may think is relevant or not relevant. So if I could summarize what you just said, tell me if I'm right. So having access to those feelings allows you to retrieve elements that would have otherwise been non-retrievable had you not been in that state. Is that basically the bottom that line? Is, uh, that is exactly okay. what we think is happening. Yes. Very interesting. All right, let's go on to the next one. Okay. Uh, oh, this one I liked. Uh, being in a relaxed state increases the monetary values of products, which by the way, let's apply it to the current context. Yep. Hopefully, if the people watching us right now are in a relaxed state, because I've got a very sexy, deep voice, they will donate more money to my YouTube channel because they will value this conversation more. Am I right? 
Uh, that's uh, that's the prediction. <laughs> <laughs> that is a prediction. So tell us about it. So this is a project where the uh, that result we did not expect it uh, beforehand. It turns out uh, it started. Uh, the other so here's the general gist. Um, in in our field, when we study feelings and emotions, we tend to separate good feelings versus bad feelings and see does it make a difference. And you know, obviously, it makes a difference. It's not it's not particularly. Uh, surprising that it makes a difference. Uh, in that paper, what we're comparing is really, you know, but now the good feelings, there are different types of good feelings. You can be either very excited or you can be very relaxed or you can be somewhere in between. And in, in, in that paper is really about now when you relax people, what does it do to their minds? And uh, which is something that marketers try to do a lot, you know. So you bring them to a, a, a business lounge, you bring them to a, a spa, you bring them to a, a fancy hotel. Um, uh, or a nice vacation resort, the, the whole mindset is trying to create a certain experience that is relaxing. The question is that people can value the experience, that's one thing, but does it do something else beyond making the experience pleasant? And so what we're comparing in that paper is really people who are feeling relaxed against people who are feeling good but not as relaxed. And, and um, so what we found is that across a variety of tasks, uh, people for some reason are willing to pay more uh, are we need to, to state the higher values uh, for a variety of products uh, that we sh just showed them. And uh, we had a very, uh, it was not an easy project to conduct because we had to create this state of relaxation in, in the lab. And, uh, and so we have, uh, you know, people who have to listen to music, relaxing music and, and things of that nature versus people who listen to, to non-relaxing music but not stressful music. And, uh, and, um, and, and ask them, okay, you know, how much would you be willing to pay, for example, for a gym membership? And that's uh, the kind of question we have them. And uh, in our studies, to give you a sense of the, uh, the effect, uh, the willingness to pay in the valuations changed by about 11%. So higher willingness to pay, a higher valuation, 11% more than when you're not relaxed but not stressed out. Very interesting. Now... Uh, of course, as you know, as somebody who sort of tries to biologize things and, yep. and Darwinize things, one mm -hmm. of the ways that I can see as a possible extension of what you're talking about is to look for uh, relaxation metrics that are uh, physiologically based. Uh, yep. So whether it be a hormonal state. And so that would be, I think, a very easy and obvious way to take the research that you're doing and then add that biological slash physiological element. No, I'd, I'd love to. Um, I, I remember when we were doing that project, I, I, I was thinking about other studies that we might have to do to flesh out the project further and, and, and looking into the biology and measurements uh, more carefully would have been an obvious, uh, uh, an obvious way to go. Um, another direction where my, one might go is to think more about the application of that you know, right. because we have these results and it, it seems to be quite robust. So we had it across a lot of studies. Um, now, what do you do with that? It has, uh, you know, and, and testing it in the field and show that it does make a, a difference. It, you know, if you would create two store environments, one that you would test to be relaxing, the other one less relaxing, does that really have the effect that we think it should have based on our findings? Very interesting. All right, two more to go. Uh, oh, this one was probably, I think, the earliest one of the ones that I've chosen is from the late 90s where you looked at. A, a negative emotion, so the valence was held constant, but the source of the negative emotion, I think it was anxiety or sadness, is what was being studied. And you showed that the way people interact with uncertainty or risk, was it, would be different depending on the source of that negative affect. Correct? Tell us about that. So, so Early on, you know, um, you know, again, in our field, we're always just comparing positive feelings versus negative feelings. But uh, we had an intuition, Raj Raghunathan and I, that that the negative, you know, I mean, that that not all feelings were the same, and not all negative feelings were the same, not not all positive feelings were the same. And and, and we started uh, comparing two emotions, uh, that, which were anxiety and, and sadness. And, and the reason we came uh, uh, to choose those two emotions is that they map very nicely uh, onto a classic decision trade-off that people make all the time, which is uh, a trade-off between risk and reward. And so very often what people have to do, they either go for an option 
that has a, a, a higher payoff, but this, these are long shots, you know, so these are the, the lotteries uh, that, which have a light, very large figures, but then there's a very small probability that you win. Uh, sorry, which we just had the winners of the Powerball, right? Exactly. It's right. so a very, very current topic as right. well. And, 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 and the other option that you have, of course, is one in which the, the odds are much better, but, but the payoff is just not as great. And, and, uh, and so um, we, uh, uh, we picked those two because um, um, essentially what uh, uh, the, those two emotions do, really, is push uh, people in opposite direction with respect to that trade-off. And in that paper, we also had a neutral state group. So we have a relaxed, a, sorry, a, an anxious group, and we had a, a sad group, and we had a neutral state group. And what you see is that compared to the neutral state group, they go in an opposite direction. The people who are um, anxious uh, go for the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the smaller reward, higher probability types of option, where the people who are sad do the opposite. They right. go for the long shot, the, something that has a higher reward uh, but they are a, a lower probability and and both of these can be explained um, using fundamental principles of how emotions are supposed to shape our lives and signal uh, the state of the environment in uh, in our lives on a related note uh, in the same way that you sort of drill down so that you're not just looking at the the valence of the emotion but you're looking at the source of that valence uh, yeah. I've done a similar drilling down, I mean, in a completely different context. This is a paper that I've yet to publish, regrettably, but hopefully will soon, where we looked at sex differences in envy, which is another important, uh, you know, can trigger a lot of emotional issues. Yeah. Uh, but specifically what we wanted to look at. So if you ask basically men and women if they're envious of, uh, say, same-sex rivals uh, on general dimensions, then you, you won't necessarily pick up any sex differences. It's not as though women are inherently more envious than men or vice versa. But then if you come from, as you know, from as I do, from an evolutionary lens and recognize that there might be a sex-specific calculus to the triggers of envy that might make women envious of other women and men of other men, then you start picking up some huge sex differences, which I think most people would have an intuitive sense of what they might be. Men might be more yeah. envious of other men for, because of social status, women because of physical looks. And so again, by, by having the capacity to be more granular in your analysis, yep. you're able to uncover some things that otherwise might have been invisible to you, right? No, no, that's, that's very nice. So I, I can see why your perspective uh, helps enrich the, uh, my perspective, which is about trying to understand the, 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 the difference between different types of emotions. But uh, I can see the other way around, right. that, that looking at difference between, uh, um, uh, between emotions is uh, also putting some, uh, shedding some light on the difference between men and women exactly. that may be biologically driven. And so this is a nice... Uh, uh, nice angle that I, I can see would uh, help you from your research right. uh, support an evolutionary uh, psychology explanation of, of many of those. Uh, the, Beautiful. Uh, and the, the last one. I like then, that result, yes. And then we'll get to the seven sins, uh, and I'll, I'll give an introduction to that paper, as the feelings uh, in the ultimatum game. And I'm, I, ah. I particularly chose that one because... Uh, I've, so before I, before I give you the floor, let me mention what the ultimatum game is to people who might not know. I've done actually, I published a paper on the ultimatum game many years ago with one of my former doctoral students. The ultimatum game basically works as follows. And again, this is not, I'm not explaining this to you, it's to the viewers. Uh, let's suppose you bring in two people into the lab, you give player A $10 and you tell him or her, her, please split this $10 with player B. There is no negotiation, there's no back and forth. Player A proposes the split, let's say, I'll keep $7, I'll give the other person $3. If player B accepts it, they both get their respective splits. If player B rejects it, they both get nothing. Hence, it's just an ultimatum. Now, I wanted to study, again, coming from an evolutionary perspective, what happens to these offers as a function of the sex makeup of the two players. There are four possibilities, right? Male, 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 female, female, male, female, female. And we had hypothesized that, of course, that variable would strongly affect the offers that are being made and we hypothesized and found that when men are offering to women this is where they want to exhibit cues of generosity and when men are facing other men this is where the intrasexual rivalry rivalry juices kick in whereas mm -hmm. women would be equally fair irrespective of who they're facing and that's exactly what we found and so with that background I give you the floor as to what you did in your own study. 
Okay, I, I'll, um, you have to remind me to tell you about another study that never was published and never was finished uh, on the Ultimatum game, okay. uh, which, which was by far maybe one of the most interesting study I did, which was a, it was a total failure. Why, why? So is it, it wasn't published because the... It wasn't published because the results were completely flat, but I'll tell you about that okay. one uh, in, in a second. Okay. The, um, so here's, uh, uh, so again, uh, we have these methods for getting people to, uh, so, so in the ultimatum games, there are two behaviors that are interesting. So it's the behavior of the person who's make the, uh, the offer and the split to other player, and we call them the proposers. <coughs> and there's the behavior of the person who receives that split and who may accept it or reject it, we call them the responder. And those two behaviors are fascinating. In, uh, in, in that paper, we studied the, uh, the, um, the effect on the proposal. So what difference does it make if you trust your feelings as a proposer? And, and um, again, I did, not necessarily, I did not expect the results that we got. Um, but what we found is that the people who, who trust their feelings tend to make offers that on average are slightly gen less generous than the people who don't trust their feelings. And uh, that's not necessarily what I expected. But uh, the one thing that's fascinating, though, is that what was the level at which they made the offer? And when they made the offer, really the model level at which the people who trust their feelings make the offer is 40%. So they actually give the other person 40% and they keep it on themselves 60%. Now, that number happens to be an important number because uh, most studies that have shown the behaviors <coughs> of the responders right. uh, have shown that at 40%, uh, most responders accept it, right. and um, and so so that is turns out to be quite related to the phenomenon of uh, the emotional oracle paper we discussed earlier. That when you trust your feelings, you seem to be able to get a good intuition of what seems to be the right things to do. Uh, uh, in, in most of these subjects, I mean, ninety nine percent of them have never played the game. This is the first time. Uh, they, they are put in those situations, but somehow trusting your feelings give you some kind of an intuition of what is about right in terms of predicting the outcome. Uh, uh, is the person going to accept it, not accept it? It's, and, and the feelings seem to be telling you this is the right thing to do, play this way. And then on, on average, what you find is that, of course, they make a bit more money because their offers uh, are not overly generous. Uh, and uh, um, and so they get to keep more. They are not overly greedy. They're not uh, rejected uh, too often. So I mean, the, what's I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Finish. Go ahead, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll tell you more about the other project. Okay. I was going to say. So I mean, what? So what seems to be running through a lot of these studies is number one, uh, be in touch with your feelings, right? I mean, uh, stereotypically, we often hear women saying, you know, we. That's one thing I despise about men. They're not in touch with their feelings. And what you're demonstrating in very elegant and sophisticated ways is that it actually pays to be in, in touch with your feelings. And I wonder if that then somehow links to something that we often hear, uh, I mean, certainly in academia, but in the popular sort of uh, medium about emotional intelligence. Is there any yeah. link between what you're doing and that construct? No, there, there, are some, there are links that are somewhat, uh, you know, it's not identical. There, there's a clearly um, some of my findings uh, are in line with this, this notion of emotional intelligence. But a lot of the, the emotional intelligence um, uh, research and, 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 you know, and discourse out there has to do more with social interactions and, uh, and, uh, and being... Uh, um, you know, sensitive and empathetic and, uh, and, and things of that nature, uh, it does not really expand to the domain of, of, of making quote-unquote rational decisions right. uh, that are often taken to be devoid of, 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 of emotional qualities. You know? And um, so, so there's, a, there's, a, there's some overlap. It's not, it's not identical, but it's connected. I just um, found, sorry, before you go on. I just found the title. It came to my head. The title, if you ever write a popular press book, yep. here's the title of your book. And I want 5% royalties on any yes, money you yes. make. It is rational to be emotional. You know, um, I think that title is, uh, I had um, in the early 2000s when I, 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 I started actually seeing all these findings, it's all thing, thinking about the rationality of, of emotions. I, I had uh, come up with a term called emotional rationality. You know, which is very similar to right. what uh, you, you, you are suggesting. And, and, I, you know, and I gave out uh, lots of little talks among academics uh, about my research and about the, the themes of that. 
one of the big regrets of uh, of of my career in, in, as an academic is that I never took the time uh, to really write a book uh, that would have a, a broader audience and, uh, and and that would have been a, a, a book that I would have liked to write and maybe one day I still you're still a young guy there's no I reason to I regret <laughs> hopefully I could do it right. um, two, two thoughts though first on the on the first thing about the, you know you got to be in touch with your emotional feelings etc I, I think it's true in general uh, but there, there are a couple of things that people necessarily uh, have to pay attention to and, and it's not always the case that the emotional person, if you will, is going to do better. Right? Right. One of the things that, uh, that I think is, is important to recognize is when you talk about emotionality, there's a whole continuum. Okay? It can go from being you know, completely going upset and berserk, going berserk, uh, completely crazy and then taking a gun and shooting, uh, shooting someone. Uh, that's not what we're talking about in my right. research, and, 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 and there's no question that extreme levels of emotions, whether it be anger or, 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 or passion or whatever, uh, can uh, lead you to, to do silly things, right. okay? Um, but, you know, there's a whole continuum, you know, and, uh, and, and, and feelings uh, play a role in your life at this whole range of things, and, and there's a whole range of, of, of at which feelings uh, you know that you know that it doesn't feel right, or you feel good about something. On average, I think really helps you, and uh, it's really at the extreme that it that it hurts you. Gotcha. The other thing that um, I would say, and I've never tested it, and that's a part of the the research that still remains to be done. But I think where the feelings are coming from is also important. And um, there's um, one of those. It's little notes in one of the findings that we had uh, in, um, in in this emotional oracle paper. Um, the, um, we had one study in which uh, people who, um, uh, uh, who trusted their feelings were able to predict at a higher rate who was going to win American Idol that season. And, and it was a, a season that had a, a guy called Chris, if I recall, and the other one, uh, Adam Lambert. And the guy called Chris won, and, and he was the underdog. He, he won this. It was a little bit of a surprise. But there are people who trusted their feelings who didn't know, uh, predicted it well. And, uh, and, and, and the reason is the people who happen to have quote unquote inside knowledge uh, mm -hmm. about the person. So sometimes you have good feelings, not so much because the feelings are summarizing everything you know. Right. Sometimes you have good feelings because you have unique knowledge right. and unique interaction with, uh, with uh, the, what you're supposed to predict. And those kind of feelings are dangerous, right? And so you may love, for example, um, uh, Bernie Sanders at, uh, uh, for personal reason, let's say, in the, in the United States, and, uh, and, 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 and because of your love of Bernie Sanders, it, you know, your, if I were to ask you, is he going to win the, the primary, is he going to win the presidential election, you might be tempted to say yes, but that feeling that you have there is not the right feeling to rely on. Right. And, and, and paradoxically, the, here's what I would say, and this is, a, a, you know, I'm already disclosing something that could be a, a subject for a book. But I suspect that if you know where your feelings are coming from, this is probably not the right type of feelings that you need to rely on. Mm. It's only the feelings where you don't know where it's coming from that are the kinds that seem to summarize a lot of the, the information that would be useful to you to make a decision. A very interesting nuance there. Uh, yeah. Do you want to... Let me tell you, me yeah, tell you about this project, if you don't mind. Please. This project that failed. The, uh, yeah, the that's, I was going to actually cure you on that, exactly. Go okay, ahead. all right. Uh, one of the things uh, that you, you, you don't know is that my brother is an academic as well. Ah. And uh, he's uh, by training a clinical psychologist and, uh, and uh, you know, he's, he's uh, well published and he's in Belgium. And, uh, but he specializes on, uh, on, uh, on clinical populations and his dissertation was about the um, uh, emotional deficits of psychopaths. Whoa. Okay? Now, um, so now one, that's sexy stuff. That is fast, fantastic, yeah. and and you know the general finding is that the psychopath exhibits a lot of emotional deficits of different types, and that's what is contributing in part to their psychopathic behavior, antisocial behavior, criminal behavior. Now, as part of his research, what he does, uh, he has access. Well, he was uh, a, a prison psychologist for a number of years, uh, and, and he also had access. He also has his director. In a in a mental hospital, director of research in a mental hospital, and 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 within the mental hospital, he has a population uh, of, of people who are internalized, 
and, and, and who score very high on psychopathy. And, and so what we did uh, two or three years, four, four or five years maybe ago, we, is run a study combining uh, playing the, uh, the ultimatum games among the, that population. And, uh, and, and the prediction that I had at that time is that, uh, and that we had at that time, is that uh, the, 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 the psychopath, you know, subject, people who would classify as such uh, based uh, on, on the clinical measures, would be the, the, the classic economists right. uh, uh, um, in the ultimatum games. You know, the economists make the prediction that in the ultimatum game, uh, you really should be just giving like a, a the dime. Sm the smallest yeah. denomination. You know, a, a very small as domination possible, just because you know you know that the other person should accept it, otherwise they get nothing, and that's the critical rational economics prediction of the of the, of how you should play the game, and we thought that maybe the psychopath will be doing that because you know they don't care about the other person, they don't care about the feelings, and uh, and so this was the prediction we made, and we it was a very elaborate experiment because people are in cells, literally in cells, and yeah. and so we had a, a, an assistant going from cell to cell. With you know, with an envelope of money, and then going and, and making the offers. You have to publish this. And no, but the, we couldn't publish it because we had z uh, flat result. It was essentially everybody within that study split fifty fifty. Well, wow. Everybody split fifty yeah. fifty, regardless of level of uh, of psychopathy. And so, what I suspect is happening in that stuff because they're all part of the same institution. Right. And uh, and and they say you know well you know we all all in the same boat and let's go fifty fifty. Right. And so that's not a publishable result, but, but you know. I love it. And I'll tell you, you know, I, uh, in the, in mid nineties, and I, I might've mentioned this story, uh, with Brian once, I'm not sure, but I had, I had seen a, uh, plenary by, uh, George Lowenstein where he was talking about hot and cold cognitions. And yep. that had motivated me to study dysphoria, which is, uh, the opposite of euphoria, which can at its extreme, it can become clinical depression. And yep. I wanted to study how dysphorics versus non-dysphorics might behave differently on a sequential decision-making task, which was the area of my doctoral dissertation. Uh, and, and, and that led me to think that, you know, it's such a shame that we don't study in consumer behavior clinical populations. And I had contacted at the time a clinical psychologist friend of mine to see if I could get access to some of his patients, but it was very, very complicated to do so. And so I simply measured, you know, regular people's dysphoric level, and a few, of course, fell almost in the clinical depression range. And so yeah. I think that's, uh, you know, as a general statement, I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for us to not just look to, you know, our undergrads and our MBA students as uh, prospective participants, but to look at these very interesting populations like clinical populations. So for example, in some of my books, I talk about dark side, you know, the biological roots of dark side consumption, things like pathological gambling and compulsive buying and eating disorders and pornographic addictions. Well, all of those folks are within clinical populations. And so I guess this is going to probably lead us very nicely into the seven sins of consumer psychology, because what we're talking about here might easily be fitted within one of the seven sins. And so maybe we could uh, move sure. on to that. Uh, you wrote in, I think it was published in 2013, and you also gave a presidential address at the annual you know, SCP conference, the Society for Consumer Psychology conference, uh, a paper where you were basically saying very honestly, and I mean, you know, you were speaking at this point as the president of the society, which uh, to me, it should be natural that we should have that self-insight, but in a world of sort of political correctness and diplomacy, uh, it was, I think, hailed by many people as very courageous that you would stand up and say, look, we do great things, but we also do things poorly. And here are seven ways that I think we could improve. And I thought that was brilliant. I think that in 20 years from now, probably that paper will be remembered more than all of your other great works. Uh, that's my prediction. And I'm in touch with my feelings. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Possibly, yes. So uh, I don't know if you want to go sort of through each of them or you want to give a general sort of broad statement. But I, I really think for people watching this, it'll be very instructive to hear your thoughts on the seven sins of consumer psychology. Oh, well, uh, thanks a lot for, for the kind words about that paper. It is, it is a, a unique opportunity when, you know, you become the president of, of, of a professional organization to, you have the, essentially the audience and the stage and nobody's going to interrupt you. <laughs> so, so you have a, an opportunity to say what you truly think. And without having the censorship that you normally go through if you go through a, 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 the academic publication process. 
And uh, and so uh, I I've been thinking about that that uh, some of my frustration as an academic and as a as a as a researcher who participated in this field that you know w that's frankly um, there's a lot of research that's just it's just not very good and and that gets published it's just not very good and, and the question is that what is it that in my mind makes research not very good and and, and it's not a matter of my own judgment it's a matter of the fact that uh, it's not very good to the extent that it, even though it's published, it basically nobody reads it, nobody cites it, it has no impact. And this is really what I was, I was trying to address. And so in our field, we've all long known that, you know, within the industry, people don't necessarily read what we do. But what was striking to me is that within academia, a lot of the stuff we do is not read either. And, and so, so clearly, if nobody reads it, uh, that's a big problem. And, and I try to think about why, why is that, that somehow a lot of things is just not, not as impactful. And I came sort of to start to think about reason why I think it's it's, it's not a, as impactful as it should be. And I sort of isolated the seven that I thought were the most critical, and this uh, this is what's the um, led to the title of that paper. Uh, I'll give you a couple of them, and you sure. know, I, and you tell me the ones that you think are, sure. are important. I have one that one favorite ones in my in my list. Go uh, for it. But. Um, but one of the things that uh, I call the, the sin of, a, of, of narrow scope is, uh, is the fact that uh, when you study consumption behavior, you should really be studying everything that leads to consumption and anything, so including the things that precede consumption and all the, all the way to the things that follow consumption. And this is really what would lead to a lot of insight. And uh, one of the things that we consistently do in our field, um, and, and most of our, our colleagues are in business schools, and, uh, and, and they think that uh, they study purchase behavior. And so, so what happens in the store, what happens right before that when people are presented with the options and try to make a choice. And, and, and that's clearly very important, but uh, over and above that, there's lots of things that are perhaps even more important. So if you go further be, uh, before that, what happens? What makes someone to want a product in it to, to begin with? What? Why is it that some people need uh, to uh, you know um, a certain type of pillows? Or why is it, uh, do people need a certain a vacation or a cruise? And and this is something that we have never really studied. Is what are the drivers of the needs to begin with? Whereas if you go to the industry and you ask uh, uh, people in, in industry, what, what would you want to know? I said, well, we try to sell more TVs, and it's not really about the choice process we're trying to understand. It's like, you know, why do people would need more TV? What is it that nowadays they, they, they feel like they need less TVs? So there's a lot more uh, uh, relevant question to be asked about the need stage uh, than about the choice stage or the decision-making right. stage. So that's what I call this, the, the sin of, of narrow, um, narrow scope. Right. No. That, do you yeah. want to go on or do you want me to yeah, go, ahead, go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, let me build into that. So that rather than sort of having you go through maybe each of the seven, yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that I've talked about uh, in my own criticism of the field is uh, uh, the idea of methodological fixation. This is a term that I, it's not my term, it's from uh, Sternberg and Grigorengo in a 2000 one American psychologist paper, but I thought that the term was so beautiful because it perfectly captures what happens in consumer psychology and consumer behavior in general. This methodological fixation is basically the idea, uh, colloquially put, of, you know, to the guy who's got the hammer, the world is looks like it's full of nails, right? Yeah. And so, you know, so if I'm a priming guy, that's what I do. If I'm a, you know, whatever, uh, uh, an experimentalist, I never do field stuff. And so what ends up happening, I think, in consumer psychology and or more generally in consumer behavior is that people are great methodologists. Uh, they're really well trained as in the practice of doing science, right? Yeah. And so if you look at the internal validity of most of the research, it's not always perfect, but you certainly can bet that given the rigor of the review process, you know, some reviewer is going to find every possible thing that you could think of. And so that, there you get the check. But then if you ask the question, who gives a damn about what you are studying? Nobody does. Okay. I mean, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm, I'm being very blunt because it's, it's really true. And, and I think, you know, and many of the seven sins that you mentioned, in a sense, relate to this general point, right? I mean, yeah. who cares? And I don't mean in the practical versus academic. Are yeah. you studying truly interesting stuff that if yeah. you and I right now are chatting and there are, there's going to be five, ten thousand people who are going to watch this clip, are they going, God damn, this is exciting stuff? Well, the reality is that if I read most of the papers in the leading journals, 
and I am vested in this field, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not interested, right? And so it fails on the, what I, uh, there's a, I don't know if you know the paper, that's interesting, 1971 paper, Philosophy of Science, where Davis basically proposed 12 criteria by mm -hmm. which you judge if something is interesting, that it gets you that exclamation <laughs> point. That's interesting. Yep. And I think many of the sins that you speak of ultimately yep. in one form or another link back to that. Do, do you agree? I, I agree that many of the ones I described are connected to that. And, you know, um, you know the, my, my advisor, Joel Cohen, used a term uh, referring to other, other researchers one day and uh, when I was uh, still training under him. And he said, I think he or she has good taste. Right. And, uh, and at, at that time, that seemed quite odd to me to be using that kind of language uh, to refer to it to a, a researcher's work. And, uh, and, and it's, it's only as, I, as my career progressed that, that I really somehow began to appreciate really what it means because it's very important. Um, I, I, I do think that um, we train doctoral students very well in terms of the methodology and, and by now, frankly, you know, it's uh, it's very difficult to see holes in research that gets submitted to the top journal because people are so well trained in the science of doing tight studies. But what people are not necessarily good uh, 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 at and is really about taste, you know. Uh, and that, thank God, you know, maybe it's a good thing. You know, maybe, thank God, not everybody has good taste because at least it still gives uh, um, different people an opportunity to differentiate themselves on the people who have a good taste versus people who don't have good taste. But I do think that it's a big, a big, uh, a big uh, separator. Uh, one of the scene that that speaks to um, to the thing that uh, you describe is the, what I call the sin of um, um, research by convenience. So the the researchers, you know, they you know, I mean, they they are they have their tools and they know there are things that are you know relatively easy to do, and uh, and what they'll do is set up their research and their research questions around the things that are easy to do. And, uh, and, and the research are easy to do. Unfortunately, not necessarily the research is more interesting. Like, for example, the study that I described to you about the psychopath in the, in the, in the mental hospital, that was very, very hard to do. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but it was interesting. If we had, uh, if we had good results, we could have published, been published in a, in a major journal, maybe in science, right. but it just didn't get the result. But that was, uh, um, and it's quite unfortunate, however, uh, that you know there's these trade-offs. You know, the, the things that are easy to do are usually not necessarily the stuff that that uh, that is interesting. I, that's what I like uh, Brian uh, uh, Ronsig's research so much because oh, yeah. a lot of his research is not easy to do, and uh, uh, but he asked very good questions and very interesting questions. And 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 as I think you might have seen when if you I, I know you you watched our chat. Yeah. I mean. I could pretty much pick up any paper that Brian Wansink has written, and I go, "God damn, that was interesting, right?" No, no, exactly. Because and he said, why, you know, oh, how did he come well, to? How this? did he thought, think of it? Be brilliant. Because, because I'm going to add to your brilliant supervisor's uh, beautiful term, taste. Let's coin a term right here in front of everybody. It's epistemological taste, right? I mean, it's yeah, it's yeah. it's right. People have fashion taste. Well, you so. I mean, if I can speak of myself, I don't, I won't, I won't dare say if I have epistemological taste or not. But here's what I do have: I have broad intellectual curiosity. Now, it has actually harmed me in terms of my career, right? Because I don't play by the rules of I only publish in these journals. I, ge I genuinely don't care. Maybe I should care more because I just find an interesting problem. For example, if you had approached me and said, "Hey, God, you want to work on the psychopathy paper?" Uh, before you finish that sentence, I would have said, "I'm on board." Now, would it have likely been published in JCR? Probably not. Now, if I wanted to go down that careerist track, I should have thought. But so in, in reality, what we need to do maybe, and certainly people like you who are sort of the gatekeeper, editorial gatekeepers can help in doing, is is there a way to change the reward metrics in our field so yeah. that we don't succumb to these biases? I, it, it's a very big challenge. I, 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 I totally agree with you that it all boils down to incentive structure. And, uh, and um, right now, the way the field is set up is that uh, your career uh, is going to advance as a function of A-level papers that you have published. You know? So if you publish 10 A-level papers, that's fantastic. If you publish five, that's not going to be as great. And, and this is you know, almost a linear mapping between people's career success, the, the schools that they end up teaching at, where they get tenure, the salaries they might get, the reputation they have. 
it's really almost linearly predicted by the number of A-level papers that they have published. Um, this is not necessarily a recipe for scholarship. And, and, and I got to think a little bit uh, based on some other readings on what does it mean to be a scholar. And um, interestingly, if you ask a layperson what is a, a great scholar, they will tell you about someone who is very uh, deep thinking, uh, is someone who is broadly read, who knows a lot, can think about clearly, but there's nothing in the, in the layperson's definition or conception of a, of, a, of a great scholar that really speaks to the number of A-level papers they have published. <laughs> we would not say this is a great scholar, oh, this person has published uh, 100 articles, a great scholar, no. It's, uh, people say, do they know a lot, right. uh, do they have a clarity of thinking, uh, and do they have a, 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 a critical mind, and are they broad and well read? This is what we, what as a layperson, would define as a great right. scholar. Now, if you look at the way our field is set up, we don't re reward great scholars, great scholars per se. You know, um, we know the only thing that they get as great scholars they get more manuscripts to reviews because they <laughs> tend to be very good at reviewing manuscripts, right. which is in fact a punishment. You know, so we send them lots of stuff to read. Right. Um, and uh, what we only review is, uh, is uh, reward is, you know, do you publish a lot of papers? Right. Which is not, I would say, it's orthogonal, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not the same. In, in fact, right. uh, you can publish a lot by reading a bit less and then just cranking out more studies. Right. And, but it's not necessarily the great scholarship in the, in the, in the general definition of the term. So true. And, and I guess that leads me to, to the next question, which is, the role of a intellectual, a professional intellectual, and I also, by the way, uh, raised this with Brian Wansing, but of course I want to get your take. And that is that, you know, I mean, we're professors in a business school, right? Uh, we teach marketing, right? So when it comes to the marketing of ideas and the engagement with ideas, yeah. most professors in the business school are abysmal and in the following sense. Uh, we have these unbelievable opportunities with all of the social media tools that, that are at our disposal to be engaging the larger audience in a, in a myriad of ways. Now, for example, publishing in those A-level journals that you're speaking of is wonderful and, and great. Go for it. Uh, but there are many other hats that as a professional intellectual, uh, you and I should be doing. And regrettably, very few of our colleagues, and I'm not sure why, maybe you could offer some hypothesis as to why that is, uh, they don't. So if you look at Twitter presence or public Facebook page presence or media presence, where we expect people who are trained to think critically and clearly to mm -hmm. have important things to say, everybody yeah. shies away from it. Uh, that's a shame. And I wonder, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? And can we change the incentive structures to make more and more people comfortable engaging in the public? I, I do think there are two reasons why okay. why people are not doing it more. First of all, I totally uh, uh, second your, your observation. It is true that that um, if you look at the people around us, the 2,000 marketing academics that we may know, uh, very few are prominently out there marketing their 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 thoughts to to a broader audience, which. It's quite amazing why we're not doing it. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible. In fact, if you look at the students, they would respect us more, honestly, uh, uh, if we they would see us on, on, on YouTube, on Facebook, on the news, than, uh, than if they were to somehow see the collection of journal or consumer research articles we have published. There's no question about that. Uh, I do think there are two reasons. Okay, one again has to do with incentives. You know, I um, you know I, I just uh, finished writing my activity report. Uh, for for the um, for this uh, past uh, past uh, year, and, and 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 it is no question that as I write it and as many of my colleagues write it, um, we we feel and, and it's probably true that uh, that the only thing that counts is really again this number of A level papers that you have published and uh, and maybe the citations possibly not even that and um, and um, all the other stuff is seen as a potentially distraction from that ultimate goal. Uh, uh, that that is put upon us by by, by institutions, and um, that's one. I do think though there's another reason. Um, I, I I suspect that a lot of marketing academics and a lot of academics in general, and that's why they're academics, are are socially anxious, and, right. and, and yeah, and uh, and they just are not very comfortable being out there, uh, you know, just socially. And now we you know, so, and, and that's really, and, you know, the reason why they, they are academics is just, just like to read, they like to be in the office by themselves, 
and, and, and to put them, you know, to, even though I see their behaviors, you know, when I, I do programs, executive programs, and I can sort of see sometimes some of my colleagues, how they interact with, uh, with executives out there, I can sort of see the, the, the nervousness that, uh, that some of my colleagues have. And that's, that's, I think, it's a very common trait among academics. And, um, and, uh, and, and we're business school academics, so we should be normally very comfortable interacting with, with the general audience, uh, the businesses, etc. cetera. Uh, and and so, so that's, if people are socially anxious, that, that makes them even less, uh, less uh, 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 likely to put their face out there like you're doing. And, and you're right. doing a fantastic job uh, Thank you. Uh, at what you're doing, and, 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 uh, and I'm glad that, that you're doing it. And I think there should be more. Right. More of that, and uh, and there should be more metrics uh, in institutions to um, to reward the uh, um, the uh, you know popularization well, uh, of of uh, of, uh, of of ideas. I'll tell you a great uh, story. I and and again, I I don't remember if I've ever mentioned this before. If I have, apologies to the viewers if you've already heard it. Uh, I uh, last year I applied for. Uh, a big government grant, uh, the equivalent of what would be called the NSF in the you know National Science Foundation grant, the equivalent version in Canada, and uh, you know all the reviewers were you know it was all very nice. There was one reviewer who had a massive beef with me. I, I don't know who it is; it's confidential. Uh, but one of the things that uh, he or she was particularly uh, uh, you know had disdain for me is because I was very known. Right, and so, the, so, so the person would list. Yeah. Right, I mean, this guy is in the media, and there are millions of people who read his stuff. And what, what a horrible thing! I mean, who would think that an academic who's read by four million people is yeah. is inherently not doing a better job than an yeah. academic who's read by three reviewers and an editor? I'm sorry, sir, I have sinned. Right, I mean, it's just, yeah. and and so his whole line of attack was yeah. that I was this sort of popularity hound, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so unless you're able to yeah. expunge this kind of profound stupidity and haughtiness, right? I mean, I'm a man of the people, right? I mean, I don't believe that I should only be talking to Michel Fan because he's a, yeah. my equal, right? If mm -hmm. I'm doing important stuff, yeah. then the people who pay for my salary sure. should have access to this, right? So it's yeah. precisely, it's my humility that mm -hmm. causes me to interact with everybody because I think that... I should be able to excite them. But yeah. this person thought that I was this sort of sellout, this sort of, this. Yeah. instead of being an artist who only plays in front of four people, I had yeah. gone billboard. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so it was just, it was just breathtaking. That, that, is, that is, two thoughts about that. I mean, uh, so first of all, the, your, so not only the incentive is not there, right? But the, 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 what you just pointed out, is that there is in fact a disincentive <laughs> yeah. for doing that. You know, there's, you, the people would punish you. Yeah. For, for for having written a popular book right. and, uh, and people will say you know the he or she has sold out you know, exactly. he's, he's, he's become the consultant he's become the guru and right. whatever and we look down on them and and and, um, and, and that, that's that's sad because that's not you know a, a business school professor should be someone who is able to reach a broad audience and as as well as having a, 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 a tight mind uh, what it speaks though is uh, and this is where we go back to psychology, uh, it has to do also with uh, the delay intuition people have about the correlation between traits. Okay, right. so so people think that there's a correlation between taste good and unhealthy, and taste uh, healthy and taste bad, right? right. And so it, and and and, and, this, and those correlations have a lot of impact on, on on what we choose to eat or not eat. And the same thing happens, and people have this intuition that someone who is popular must be definitely a less rigorous scholar right. and, you know and, and whereas you know I, I think these are orthogonal dimensions it really is a matter of uh, how you spend your time uh, and, uh, and and that needs to be tested you know right. um, I um, there are certainly very good scholars who have had it, had it, uh, hit it both ways and, and done very well you know I think Brian's a great one within yeah. our field a, a great scholar who, whose research I, I like uh, scientific from a scientific norm standpoint but has been able to reach a broad audience. And, I'm sh and, and there are scholars who are mediocre on both dimensions, right? right? And, um, and, and, and so conceptually, at least, uh, the correlation is not high. We don't, I don't know empirically what it is. Well, but, I think uh, you, you get a similar uh, uh, incorrect correlational link mm -hmm. uh, between uh, being a great teacher and being yeah. a great scholar, right? So you often, yeah. uh, people think that these things are mutually exclusive, right? I mean, yeah. if you're a great scholar, 
you inherently must really be bad when you get up. If, and, and, and if you're very good in reaching your students, surely you must be a poor scientist, but you can't be both. Well, yeah. uh, I could name off the top of my head 10 people right now who are, you know, breathtakingly accomplished scientists who are some, some of the most eloquent speakers. Actually, one of them uh, that I recently communicated with, you, you may not know him because he doesn't run in our circles, uh, Robert Sapolsky is a neurobiologist at Stanford who is a, you know, profoundly accomplished neurobiologist. Uh, certainly his metrics would make anybody in marketing be stand up and take notice. Uh, and yet if you go to uh, YouTube and watch the number of views of some of his appearances, I mean, it's just breathtaking, right? He gives a lecture, there are 900,000 views. Oh my uh, God. Right? I mean, <laughs> right? So again, we, we need to change the currency of how we define ourselves. We are meme creators, yeah. and we do that through our science, and we are meme propagators. Put those two together, and you've got the, the ideal intellectual. Uh, and so hopefully, these types of conversations that we're, happy, that we're having are not going to change the field overnight, but hopefully they serve as a start of a discussion on these important issues, right? Hopefully, yeah, hopefully. There's a lot of things that, uh, that need to change. It's not going to happen overnight. I... You know, I, in one of my, my pet projects, uh, it's you know back of my mind as a follow-up to the Seven Sins paper, is, is to promote another metric for, for measuring people's impact. And, uh, and, uh, and um, uh, it's a bit too early to, to reveal what it would look like, but uh, I do think that uh, unless additional metrics that are easy to grasp, that have an intuitive uh, uh, appeal, uh, that are easy to report, that are, um, are being promoted uh, in the field, uh, it's going to be uh, uh, tough to change uh, behaviors on, on, on a large scale. Now, right. you know, we, you and I are at a stage in our career where we can afford to take risk and, you know, right. and so hopefully uh, more people like us will be doing, hopefully, you know, you have taken much more risk than, than I have, <laughs> but uh, the, um, uh, I mean, uh, perhaps this is not the, the assistant professors who need to right. take those risks. Right. But um, hopefully, if there are enough people who, who choose a slightly different career path later on uh, in their careers, right. you know, hopefully, people this will be well. And I, and I think, yeah, yeah, I, I, somebody like you who uh, obviously stood as an important uh, influencer in the field, when you are on record saying this, uh, yes, it's true that the assistant professor may not have the courage today. To, uh, to, to do whatever we're asking him or her to do, but there is social proofing, right? I mean, he's, he's yeah. looking at somebody who he obviously highly respects, who he'd like to emulate, who's saying, hey, I I'm here on record saying that things need to change. So, so I think this conversation might hopefully be more influential than, than, than we might otherwise uh, hope for. So let's see. Uh, two, let's more, see. two more questions. Uh, so question one, uh, it kind of relates to what we're talking about, careers and so on. Uh, yeah. You're about midway through your career. We both are. Yeah. Up to now, what would you say? Midway is a bit generous. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, this is well, yeah, it's about you know, no. It's about, so, hey, why not? Uh, <laughs> where, are, are you? Did you hit the five zero yet, or not yet? Yes, I did. I yeah, did. So, so did I. Uh, so, what are some of the things that you love most in your profession as a professor, and what are a few things that you uh, you know dislike the most? And I ask this because. You know, a, a lot of people write to me saying, hey, you know, I, I watch what you do and I would love to be an academic. What are, you know, what are the pros? What are the cons? So I, I'd, I'd be curious to know what are your take on this question? I, I, I as being a professor or being a business school professor? Uh, whatever you'd like. I mean, I think first as a professor, and if you want to then, uh, you know, drill it down to business school, if there's anything I mean, you... I Okay, I, I love the uh, the intellectual stimulation that that comes being uh, being an academic and being uh, uh, a, a allowed to to explore things and, and, and make a living out of uh, of uh, satisfying my own curiosity. That that is amazing, uh, uh, and, and a lot of academics have this this freedom to, to you know explore ideas and test them. You know, I've. If, you, if I were to turn my camera the other way around, you would see my bookshelf. It's full of books, and, and I get paid to read them. You know, yeah. and that 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 to me is is fantastic. The second thing is um, that uh, life as an academic is, is is terrific. Is the fact that we are constantly working on new ideas, on on new projects. Um, very often, when uh, uh, people from industry comes to me uh, and say, you know what, I'm trying to change my career and uh, and I want to do a PhD, and very often. 
they tell me, you know what, I, I'm tired of doing the same thing over and over again. And uh, whereas in academia, you essentially get a chance to do, yes, you, you do research over and over again, but uh, you get to do research on new projects, uh, and, and very often you are setting those projects agenda uh, on your own. I love, uh, to be honest, not having a boss. Okay, I mean, I, I mean, I, I have a boss officially, but uh, but uh, uh, you, you have an enormous uh, freedom over how you allocate your time. You you, you work uh, a lot of hours, but you at least are, are dictating what those hours should be and, and when they should be, and uh, that to me is a, is a great uh, it's a great perk of the business. Um, now, being a business school professor and a consumer researcher, I would say there's a couple of things that I think uh, are, are interesting. Uh, one is, uh, is the ability to connect what you do with, with things that are happening in the real world because everybody is a consumer. So there's an intuitive uh, uh, appeal with a topic which, which may seem very mundane, you know, consumption behavior, you know, so you buy a Coke at, at a dollar what is there to be to studying that you know when you dig uh, scratch below the surface there's a lot of richness that comes along with that that uh, provides you uh, it, an opportunity to connect what you do with with people's real lives that's appeal number one the second appeal is the fact that we happen to be in a field that is interdisciplinary or at least it's meant to be right. where there's a lot of different perspectives for studying the same research of questions sets of questions and so you look at it from a uh, a virtual psychology perspective, I look at it from a social psychology perspective, others have adopted anthropological perspective and so on and so forth. So that is a, a, a great, um, a great uh, uh, thing about our field. Uh, and the third thing is that the, uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it's a field that, that is a healthy field because uh, it's, uh, it's, there's money pouring into the field. It's just, it's really, uh, it, it's, it's going to do as well as the business field does. And, uh, and, uh, and, and so uh, it's not, you're not starving as an academic, right. you know, it's, uh, it, it is something that will always have relevance and, and, uh, and um, we, at least if it's done well right. and, uh, and, and will be a, remain a, a, an, area, an area for investigation. The downsides? Uh, downsides, um, to be honest, uh, the, uh, um, or, or being a professor or being a professor in a business school? Professor, general. Uh, being a professor, um, I think one of the things that, that bugs me uh, is, um, is when people, uh, when you go to a, a dinner party or a cocktail party and, and, and people ask you, what do you do uh, uh, for a living? I say, oh, I'm a professor. And, and they say, oh, okay. Um, and the question I always have is like, uh, what do you do when you're not teaching? You know, and it's this question, like this perception. You surf, that, right? You go surfing, don't you? Yeah, yeah. I go surfing. Yeah. I have this tan and I... Yeah, yeah. I Got nothing else to do. It's only uh, three months a year, or whatever, six hours per week, and and it, it's incredible uh, this this lack of uh, of uh, of recognition of, uh, of of the workload that 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 uh, a professor who's active uh, has. I I was speaking to um, to a colleague of mine just uh, just wishing he's an accounting guy, and the guy spent uh, several years in uh, at at a at a major uh, investment bank. Uh, uh, you know, so he left academia and then came back to. Uh, to, to academia, and they told me, you know, my heart, my blood pressure was lower when I was at that at that yeah. firm, you know, yeah. and it, because uh, we have so many jobs uh, uh, to 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 manage, and um, so that's perhaps one of the things that uh, I, I uh, that may be a downside of the business. But frankly, I, uh, it, I perhaps another downside is per, uh, the the not having enough opportunity to see the impact of what you think. Right uh, on the real world, and uh, this, and that's you know, it's, it's always a challenge. If it's uh, you know, if you're a teacher, if you, and if you're a math teacher, let's say in, in high school, you have immediate metrics of whether right. whether what you you're doing uh, is uh, uh, it, it, does it does it work or doesn't work, not right. work. Um, if you are a scientist and uh, working in a university, you don't necessarily have the the immediate. Uh, um, feedback on, on the long-term and true implication. You, you know how you get it? You get it by doing these public engagements as we're doing right now, right? Because when I put up this clip and within three hours or whatever it is, three days, you know, 5,000 people have watched it. I've received a hundred emails about it. Um, you know, and it's not, you know, it's, it's not a narcissistic thing, right? It's not as though, uh, you know, I'm doing it so that people can send me emails, but, but it is immediately getting me feedback that people are consuming what I'm doing 
and are appreciating it, right? When, when we work on an academic paper that takes, you know, two, three, four, five years from the inception of the idea to go through the review process, uh, I mean, that's brutal. Of course, we have to do it. I mean, ultimately, we're professional. Way, and go ahead. Some of my papers, I, I, I tallied some of them. Some of my papers uh, took 11 years. So I think that's my record. 11 years. And I have several that took about 10 from, years. From inception to end or just the yeah. review? No, yeah, okay. No, 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 from, from inception to end. Right, right. Uh, well, just... Uh, Go ahead, go ahead. It's a relaxation paper that uh, that you uh, you meant we discussed earlier. Uh, after it got published, it probably got published in 2011. Um, I went back with Jerry Gorn, who is a good friend of mine. Great and guy. We, we were thinking about starting a, a yes, yeah, great guy. Um, we were still thinking about starting a next project because we, we actually are working on this project because we are friends and we said okay, let's let's do something together. And, and so I went back to my notes and my emails from when we started, and it was starting in 2000. Okay, well, I, I'm going to beat that record. Uh, okay. I have a paper that came out last year. Uh, it's a paper on, it's one of my few non-evolutionary psychology papers. Uh, it was, uh, the data was collected with one of my former MSc students as part of his thesis. He defended his thesis, I think, in 1998 or 99, and the paper was published in 2000. 15. <laughs> so I beat you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I have a long way to go. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you mentioned something, and then I'll get to the final question and we'll wrap it up. You mentioned something about f the freedom that, you know, that, that is afforded in academia. And I often tell people that, look, I, I work, you know, 18-hour days, uh, but yet I always feel free because there is nobody who is imposing on me a particular schedule. And this actually, I'm going to link it back to something I mentioned earlier, Robert Sapolsky, the, the neurobiologist. He had studied uh, uh, baboon cortisol levels, uh, depending on where they are in the hierarchy. And he showed that, you know, uh, guys who are, or baboons who are lower on the hierarchy had greater cortisol levels than guys higher on the hi hierarchy, which you might think, opposite possibly because you might think the higher I'm up the more stressful my life is I've mm -hmm. got to protect against all these other guys trying to mm -hmm. take my job now that study or that rough finding was replicated with uh, cortisol levels of people who are at, at in professions of different statuses and it mm -hmm. turns out that the CEO has actually lower cortisol levels than the factory worker and you would think, well, how could that be? The factory worker does the same thing. He, everything is set for him, whereas the CEO has incredible pressures. And, of course, cortisol is, is, a, is a hormone that is a stress uh, hormone, right? And yeah. so it captures how much stress you have, and it's got a lot of uh, downstream negative effects on your health. Well, the argument for why that CEO has lesser uh, levels of cortisol is very much related to the freedom point that you mentioned, which yeah. is that... The fact that you've got freedom to navigate through your day actually serves as a strong protector against stress, even though you're working 18 hours a day. But mm -hmm. the, the poor chap who is told when he can go relieve his bodily functions from 9.50 to 9.55, he actually experiences greater stress. So you're definitely on to something in terms of your freedom argument. No, no, I, uh, it's, a, it's a great finding and I... Uh... I come to appreciate my job even more after hearing it. <laughs> there you go. Last question, uh, which is kind of a strange way to, to end it, but uh, I think a very topical one. I don't know if you've been following all this stuff, and I've been at the forefront of, if I may say, of fighting all this stupidity. Yeah. Uh, uh, microaggressions, safe spaces, uh, yeah. trigger warnings. Uh, has that at all entered your reality at Columbia Business School? If yes, tell us about it. And if no, tell us about what your position on this whole thing is. Um, yeah, I, I gotta be careful that one here because uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm testing your capacity You're to break out of the bubble. My, 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 my academic freedom. There you go. Uh, the um, there's no question that that there's uh, more tension, as you know, um, on campuses uh, um, that puts puts uh, the uh, I think a laudable goal, which is inclusiveness and respect and, 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 and empathy and so on and so forth, which is one side of, 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 of the argument, with another one which has been a long-standing goal and, and in fact should be a long-standing mission of an academic institution, which is the, 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 the diffusion of science and knowledge and, and, and ideas and, 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 and the, 
the intellectual discourse that comes along with this. And, and, and so clearly now we are hearing more clashes. Um, the, um, I, I think that uh, I do feel it more uh, uh, than... than in, uh, in that students are, are uh, exhibiting sensitivity if you raise I, issues I, I, A or I, B? I, I, I discussed a, a, a result, a scientific result. It was marked as such on my on my on my uh, on my on my notes. It was teacher course on consumer insight, and I had uh, a slide uh, that was uh, showing a, a result of a of a finding by Gavin Fitzsimmons and um, and Andrea Morales. And and and, and the, that paper is about the effects of contagion of disgust. Oh so, yes, yeah, sure. So 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 the finding in that paper is that you know when when there are products that for which some people might experience disgust, you know, and and and, and, and others that, that people have an appetite for. And if you touch these if the two products touch in a shopping cart, then people ha uh, you know somehow imagine that there's some kind of contagion from one product into the other one and tend to avoid the the, the products. So that's the result. And and and, uh, and this, this one of the studies that I recall from that paper and that I was quoting is the fact that uh, they use as the quote unquote disgusting product uh, women hygienic napkins. And the uh, I know where this is going, but go ahead. You know where this is going. And 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 I re I relate the findings I uh, in my class and and, and that there was some student who who got upset that uh, that what I was uh, relaying was uh, was conducive not. A hostile environment uh, to, 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 what, uh, to what women. So, you know, and it was a scientific finding. Okay? Wow, wow, wow. And, wow. Uh, yeah. Incredible. Uh, yeah. Well, I think. So it's, and, and nowadays, you know, and this is where I, and now you go back to, the, uh, to, 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 to how the times have changed, um, those things are becoming even more and more an issue, not just because of the, of the, uh, of, of the culture that, of the, uh, uh, that has changed. But uh, this is being uh, uh, amplified by, by social media. So, yeah. so now you know, everything gets recorded and, and everything can be shared and, and everything can be uh, uh, distorted, taken out of context and, uh, and, uh, and, and could be used to, 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 to damage people's reputations. You know, I could, I could tell you this. Uh, I uh, had a Twitter exchange at one point with a very, very famous uh, psychologist. I won't mention him because I don't, I don't want to... Yeah, well, for obvious reasons, not to, I don't want to shame him or anything, uh, where he was disagreeing with me uh, at the time uh, regarding my position on trigger warnings. Uh, and then, of course, now that there is a greater number of people speaking out against trigger warnings, and I dare say that I was very much at the forefront of being one of the few ones who was really repeatedly mocking and satirizing this profound attack on just freedom of speech, uh, now he seems to have changed his tone. Uh, I thought at one point of sending him an email saying, "Boy, boy, boy, has your have your views changed?" But I don't want to gloat, so I I, I took the gracious approach. Uh, yeah. but, but I mean, my point is that I think that as more people uh, in important roles in academia, and I think there was a recently a I can't remember a president of a university who came out very forcefully saying, "Look, this has to stop. Universities are about exchanging ideas. If an idea." Uh, makes you feel uncomfortable, then you shouldn't be in university. Now, that to me shouldn't be such a shocking statement for a university yep, president I mean, to make, but he yep. was hailed as a courageous hero for yep. saying something that otherwise should be profoundly sure, sure. banal. So I think it's important that we go on record saying, look, of course we want to be sure. empath empathetic to yep. everybody. And if somebody truly has some triggering thing that they uh, want to discuss with you privately, fine. But to, to have to put a trigger warning for every possible topic that falls under the sun uh, sure. becomes just a, a, a an Orwellian reality that we have to fight against, right? I, I think it's also connected to another trend in academic institutions that you're probably aware of is, is the shifting of decision-making power from the faculty who used historically to be really administering the universities and taking terms to a professional administration structure where, where, where uh, uh, you know, a lot of these rules are coming up. And, uh, and so there's a book that's on my shelf right behind me called, it's called The Fall of the Faculty, uh, where, you know, the, you know the, 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 it's an academic somehow who surveys and shows that universities have bloated themselves over the years uh, with layers and layers of ad administrative structure. And, and the administrative structure is taking more and more in decision-making role and 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 and, uh, and and uh and some of it is just not value adding a lot of it is not value adding and 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 and, and it's contributing to those kind of uh, 
of uh, of uh, of things that are happening in the you know in the classrooms that did not used to happen. Uh, that, that's a fantastic point, by the way, and it was raised in another book that I want to plug uh, called Unlearning Liberty by Greg Lukianov. He was actually one of uh, a guest on my show. He's a uh, First Amendment lawyer who's the president of FIRE. FIRE is the foundation of individual rights in uh, education. And so his organization files lawsuits against universities when they violate either staff or professors or students' First Amendment rights. And you might say, well, how does that happen? Well, whenever you've got university speech codes, uh, you know, you can't say this and don't say that and don't say this word. By definition, the speech code is in violation of the First Amendment or something like this. Uh, mm -hmm. You're allowed to speak freely, but we're going to designate a free speech zone for you where you're allowed to speak freely on caps. I mean, that's breathtaking, yeah. right? I mean, the United States is a free speech zone, not yeah. a particular zone at Columbia University next to McGuire Building, right? Yeah. And so he actually raises exactly the same point that, as that you do, and that is that the the professional sort of administrators that have come in to justify their existence come up with ever new ways to make life hellish for everybody, including the imposition of these speech codes. So, so you're you're right on point. Uh, anything else you want to say before uh, we wrap it up, uh, Michel? It's been a great chat. I mean, uh, keep up the good work, you man. Uh, I'm very impressed. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure having you. Of course, we could oh. go on for another three hours. Uh, I will p put a link to your uh, website. Is there anything else that you want to promote, or is that it? Is there a project or a lab page or something that you'd like me to maybe point to in the uh, description of the? You can point to that uh, the the link to the uh, the, uh, the seven scenes address, which is somewhere on YouTube. I'll find it. To be connected because it's uh, it's you know. People can sort of see what are the other six things we didn't get to discuss. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, stay on the line. I'm gonna stop okay. the, the 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 recording. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle.